Yon. Agyan ite merandosya, yamong jarasara kaya chakshur mekate altos may sri gurveda. Gurve gaur chandra yadari kai tadalaye, Krishna ya Krishna bhakta ya tad bhakta Yam prabhajanta murte cha apete kritam, Papairo karaka kara amajuhava, Utreti tan maitaya tarago vinedas, Tam sabhutam hedaya murmanatasmi, Bhatya vihina padada lakshai, Kirtas chakamari karanga vaye, Kripa naitam sharanam kupanda, Vinde namaste chandra vintam, Devasmi, Devasmi, Jiva Mitraya Vina, Niti Nikaya Rahe, Tom Nairam Chamke, Vancha Kalpa Tirugascha, Kripa Sindhu Vircha, Nikaram Padre Gyo So we begin this. Ongoing recitation of Sri Bhaktivedanta Thakur's notes on the Bhagavad. My first off and most humble basics is unto the feet of our beloved Gurus. And to Sri Nityadeva Bhavishta, O Vishnupad, Asko, Tadasatasisima, Bhaktivedanta, Swamina, Shri Bhagavad. And the same heart of the basics is unto the feet of Sri Nityadeva Bhavishta, O Vishnupad. Asto Tansatisima Bhakti Veda Narayan Goswami Maharaj and unto Sri Bhakti Veda Thakur himself, Gaur Shakti Sarupaya, and unto our exalted Rupanuga Gurdwarga, and to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but for me, this is a big crowd. Because in Bangalore, I missed out in the morning program, maybe one guy sitting there, somebody in the kitchen, somebody in the altar, a couple upstairs sleeping. So for me, it's just packed. And I'm kind of overwhelmed and uh, I feel threatened by this large audience. Okay. Maybe more coming. Maybe. Maybe. Not a problem. This is Black Mirror you know, Temple. I always remember. Somebody will hear from here. I just remember always the story of Srila Prabhupada when he was living up on the west side somewhere in some apartment and he had invited people for a lecture and nobody showed up. And he had gotten a tape recorder, just got a tape recorder, let's speak real to reels. And he recorded it, he recorded the lecture and then in his notebook he wrote lecture tonight, something like that. Nobody attended. You know, uh, but very successful <laughs> because the success comes, at least for, especially for us, in the recitation itself, in the preaching. If you simply read, you won't get realization in the same way. Uh, but by speaking this literature, even from a practical point of view, it helps you to focus and understand it better, but from a spiritual perspective, anybody who has ever preached, either in front of an audience or out on the streets with a book, you, or in, in, in discussions with other Vaishnavas, you find that things come into your heart and come out of your mouth that you didn't know you had. You just don't. And this is a realization common to everyone. It's discussed, even Sri Gurudev himself discusses that in his own experience. And Sri Prabhupada would also say the same thing. He's, in their case, whatever's coming out of their mouth is being directly dictated from the heart by Sri Krishna. And we get a semblance of that as well. This is how realization comes to us. And it's very gratifying and encouraging. Bhakti is not a dry, theoretical process. It's based on actual realization, vidya. Uh, Shri Prabhupada would translate that word vidya into scientific knowledge. Science means that you have a conception 
that can be realized by regular reproducible experimental process. So our process of sodium bhakti is the process, and anyone who takes it up will get that same result, step by step. And so uh, whatever you hear, you should try to repeat. Write down, contemplate, uh, in this way, realization will come. If you're just a, uh, a scholar who just reads, it won't come in the same way. You won't even remember it very well. Uh, but when you speak, uh, it's fixed. So I'm going to just review a couple of things from yesterday to back us up. I spent hours yesterday with this document, and I underlined, and I highlighted, and I bolded, and I put in different colors, and so that all the it's hard to read from a document and lecture from it without getting bogged down in all of it. I thought, tomorrow I'll have it. And I somehow I opened it up this morning and all of that was gone. I don't know what happened. Maybe I left it, I didn't save it somehow. You know, I went through the process. So, something is there. But there's, today there'll be a lot of technical words and I wanted to bring them out. So, anyway, yesterday, uh, we were reviewing some of the statements of Bhaktivinoda Thakur about uh, the nature of the Bhagavad itself. He had an overview of Sambandha, Prayojan, and, and Abhideya. He talked about the controversial passages concerning descriptions of heaven and hell. Let me read this to you. It's just interesting. Remember we were talking about that, how Bhaktivinoda Thakur was trying to make uh, it compatible to people. So, if you've ever read Fifth Canto, it's quite frightening, the details of that. Also, it contains passages about the structure of the universe, the cosmology, which completely fly in the face of modern science. And I remember when this came out, and we were traveling on a bus, I was giving classes every day, and I remember when I started describing where the moon is, how far away, all these different things. And I remember when you know Remember Viapi? You know Viapi? You mean Savasa brother? Yeah, yeah. Savasa brother. He was there, a great guy. His three brothers, it's Savas, it's Viapi, and... and Kappa. Oh, that Kappa, yeah, of course. And uh, Viapi just looks at me, what do you mean? We didn't go to the moon. <laughs> That's impossible! I saw it on TV! <laughs> it was a real tester of our faith. Later on, Srila Prabhupada, when there was all this hue and cry about this, he sort of also dismissed it. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Whatever the scientists say, I automatically say the opposite. And so if you don't have faith in that, don't let it disturb your faith in what's really important, the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. So he says here, there are certainly poetical, uh, uh, oh, controversial passages concerning descriptions of hell. These are certainly poetical and were originally created by the rulers of the country in order to check evil deeds of the ignorant people who were not able to understand the conclusions of philosophy. Okay. So, what he's saying, were the rulers of the country? Manus. <laughs> the great original kings, you know, the, the, the sons of Lord Brahma, they created these. And they were created to check uh, the evil deeds of people. The codes of modern were done like that. But, but because people thought that these were just recent historical kings, he appears to be diminishing the importance of it. He says, the religion of the Bhagavad is free from such a poetry Indeed, in some of the chapters, we meet with descriptions of these hells and heavens and accounts of curious tales, but we've been warned somewhere in the book not to accept them as real facts, but as inventions to overawe the wicked and to improve the simple and the ignorant. So there are some parts of the Bhagavad Gita, story of Kalenjana and others, that are metaphorical, which are meant to convey a message within the context of, just like Varnashram Dharma regulates less qualified people in their actions so that they can gradually become more eligible 
and capable of following uh, rules and regulations that are favorable for more advanced development of spirituality. I'm not saying that it's all not true, but he appears to be saying like that. He says, the Bhagavad certainly tells us of a state of reward and punishment in the future according to deeds performed in our present situation. He says, all poetic conventions, besides this spiritual fact, have been described as statements borrowed from other works in the way of preservation of old traditions in the book which superseded them and put an end to the necessity of their storage. So it's true that Bhagavatam has some of the same stories that other Quranists have. Uh, because he then says, if the whole stock of Hindu theological works which preceded the Bhagavad were burnt like the Alexandrian library, and the sacred Bhagavad alone was preserved as it is, not a part of the philosophy of the Hindus, except that of the atheistic sects, would be lost. The Bhagavad therefore may be styled both as a religious work and a compendium of all Hindu history and philosophy. So essentially, Bhagavad has all of it. But where it has teachings that appear to be less advanced or less developed, they are always still contained within the context of the message of the Bhagavad, which is Dharma Projita Kaitavotra Paramo Nilatsanaram Satam, completely kicking out all religious and, and other conceptions which have any taint of materialism uh, or, 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 or teachings that cause material attachment or knowledge that covers the pure conception of Bhagavan or results in impersonal realization. Bhagavan conveys nor, neither conveys nor, um, or acknowledges that. There may be some place where it's described, but it's always described in the context of where it fits in with the higher teachings. It doesn't advocate this. So, um, it's like you have the stories of the four Kumaras, Shukadeva Goswami, both of whom appear to be at some point on the platform of Brahman realization. Brahman realization is certainly <coughs> described, but it's described in the context of, the, uh, of where it stands in the entire cosmology, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So all of the different phases and systems of knowledge are knowledge. There's also the, the Sankhya Yoga of Kapiladev and the realizations of Devahuti. But they're shown in the progressive evolution of theistic thought. Gradually, as as as, as was saying, from the uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh cantos. Uh, and as Dr. Gnosis said earlier, the progress of spiritual thought, ultimately from Shantaras, Dasiras, uh, Sakiras, Natsalya, and Madhurya. So, but he says it in such a clever way to pacify and put at ease people. So what does the Bhagavad do? He says it does not allow its followers to ask anything from God except eternal love towards him. The kingdom of the world, the beauties of the local heavens, and the sovereignty over the material world are never the subjects of Vaishnava prayer. So while containing information of these different worlds, the lifestyles, and uh, aspirations of these denizens of the higher planets, the Bhagavad never says that this is the goal. It may describe the kingdoms of Lord Indra, but it never makes that a goal. And this is what differentiates it, because in the other Puranas, there may be some confusion there. And this is what, in the fifth chapter, fourth and fifth chapter, Narad Muni conveys to Vedavyas that after having compiled all of the Vedic literature up to, but not the Bhagavatam, only the first four shlokas, he was not satisfied at heart. And he wasn't sure why. And then Narayana confirmed to him, it's because you have not conveyed in a spotlessly pure way the ultimate objective, which is the narration and glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as being the only object 
pure service apart from any self-interest. Whereas in the other Puranas, it's not so clear. There may be some, um, um, how would you say, um, statements which allow or acknowledge those ideals. And so if you have that kind of ideal, and if you're attracted, you may find some place there that says, yes, yes, go ahead. And that's why, you know, in modern uh, India, uh, Hindus, you know, all paths are the same. All gods are the same. It's all one, it's all the same. This does like all rivers go into the same sea. You know, whatever you do will result in the same thing. But it's not what he's saying, it's not true. Um, so then, so Bhagwan, I, I'm going to read those two prayers again that I read at the end yesterday. This is the Vaishnava prayer. See, we don't want any of these things. The Vaishnava rather says, Father, Master, God, Friend, and Husband of my soul, hallowed be thy name. I do not approach you for anything which you have already given me. I have sinned against you, and now I repent and solicit your pardon. Let thy holiness touch my soul and make me free from grossness. Let my spirit be devoted meekly to your holy service in absolute love towards thee. I have called you my God. And let my soul be wrapped up in admiration at your greatness. So if you're in Shantaras, this mood, you're my God, I am wrapped up in admiration of your greatness. I have addressed you as my master, and let my soul be strongly devoted to your service. Asuras. I have called you my friend, and let my soul be in reverential love towards you and not in dread or fear. I have called you my husband, and let my spiritual nature be in eternal union with you, forever loving and never dreading or feeling disgust. Father, let me have strength enough to go up to you as the consort of my soul, so that we may be one in eternal love. Peace to the world. So he goes even beyond the idea of the Lord as husband and suggest the position of the gopis as a conscious. Uh, which page is it? And also, I don't see the Vatsalya last page. He doesn't say it. is calling him father. Okay. Sometimes Bhaktivedanta Thakur would say sound that Christianity sound. is Vatsalya, but it's a little shifted because the Lord is the father. But still, the conception of the relationship between father and son, but it gets a little shifted. But he introduces the idea of Fatsaya in that way. The Lord as Father rather than as us as Father. Which page is that? I don't know what page. Oh, 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 it is. I, I numbered it. That's page eight. Page of which book? Uh, the, 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 the word form of this notes on the Bhagavad. Whose prayer is this? This is Bhagavad Gita. This is Bhagavad Gita, we're speaking. The, the name of the book is? Notes of the Bhagavad. You have it now? Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful prayer. Start in a prayer. Um, so again, because in most religion, people perceive the Lord as water supplier. You know, this, this God is our supplier. And of course, devotees also acknowledge that. One of the two symptoms of the Lord is the maintainer and the protector of his devotee in all cases. But the devotee never prays for anything specific. Whatever you care to give, whatever you want, that is fine. I don't want anything but to serve you. And if the Lord does in fact supply, there's a beautiful story that we would always hear when we would go on part of to Terakadamba, the place of Rupa Goswami. And Rupa Goswami was receiving his brother Sanatan. And Rupa Goswami lived out in that very remote place near Nandagan. Uh, and 
did a great deal of writing and solitary pleasure. But Sanatana Goswami came to visit him one day, and Rupa Goswami, having nothing, was thinking, oh, if only I had some nice sweet rice here that I could offer my brother. And then they became absorbed in their heart of God, and suddenly a, a young, beautiful village girl came and said, oh, Baba, Dr. Goswami, I brought you some milk, some sugar, and some rice. I know, you know, so I, you have nothing and, and you can cook this and offer it to your Prabhu, your Dhaprajee, and, and, and have it. And they were for instance, thinking, oh, this is great. But then they got absorbed in hard kata again and they forgot to cook. And she came back again after some time and said, they're not cooking. They're not cooking. So she gathered some dried cow dung, blew on it, started a fire, and very quickly an expert cooked it. And then interrupted, oh, excuse me, in a very sweet voice, with very charming, beautiful glances, very humble. Oh, now I've cooked this for you. you please offer this to your Prabhu, to Krishna. And you take it. And they were surprised. Oh, thank you, lovely. Thank you, thank you. And then they offered it. And then Sri Goswami gave it to Sanatana Goswami. And they both took, and Sanatana Goswami was overwhelmed with these feelings, these moods of praying washing over him like he had never experienced. Because bhakti is always increasing. You know, even Sanatana and Rupa Goswami can experience newer and fresher ways of praying. And feelings of affection and remembrance of Srimati Radhika. And Sanatana Goswami being very intelligent. said, I've never tasted anything like this here before. And they said, Rupa, were you asking for anything before Thinking of anything that you wanted something before I came? I said, well, yes, I was thinking, I wish I had something to offer you. And he says, oh, do you know who that girl was? Do you know what we've done? This is Chimati Monica herself. She's cooked for us. She cooked for us, and we accepted it. Oh, and even though, of course, they were relishing this, the idea of accepting service from Radhika because their whole mood was up, their whole Abhiman is we're Radhika's servants. What, is she doing something for us? No, we should only be doing it for her. And they're embarrassed and ashamed in their ecstasy. But this is the nature of the relationship between the Lord and the Lord's servants. And Radhika is also the Lord and her servants. Uh, she's the supreme mistress. Just as the servant wants to serve God, in that exalted state of praying, we also, the, 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 the Krishna and Radhika want to serve their devotees. But we don't pray for that. And we don't pray for it. You know, generally in modern religion, you know, it's accepted as commonplace. You know, people sit down, oh my Lord, we thank you for these blessings thou hast bestowed upon us. Our beautiful house, our wonderful children, thank you for your blessings. And you want to give us more, that's good too. Uh, <laughs> but actually, because people don't have a conception of a higher realm, they don't have an idea of the spiritual reality that, that this is the real place of our relationship with God, that they understand that, oh, this material world is the creation of the Lord, and therefore everything we're getting is from Him, but they think that this is what it's supposed to be that I'm supposed to be here and enjoy, and the Lord is giving me these things to enjoy. He has made us owner supplier, and the house is stated, I have given you all the fruits and flowers and trees and animals and dominion over all that be. And they take dominion to mean lordship, and that it's therefore meant for our enjoyment and exploitation rather than dominion meaning you are now the servant and the caretaker of all my other subjects and use it in my service. They're thinking the Lord's given it to us to enjoy. So we can do anything with any of them. Slaughter the calf, slaughter the lamb, slaughter this one, smite this enemy, smite that enemy. You know, it's all ours and God's blessing us. And every religion thinks like this. Our God is a vengeful, mighty God and your God is a bogus one so I'm going to fight and kill you to you acknowledge our God, let the best God win. Constantly fighting. The divine Shrava, very humble, just wants to use everything in the service 
of God, nothing for themselves. So then he says the the Vaishnava doesn't expect to be king of a certain part of the universe after death. So many religions, you know, point to enjoying in that heavenly realm. The idea of service to the Lord is never really developed. If you grew up as a Christian, what did you really know? Uh, somewhere up there, there's something up in the clouds or something, you know. Uh, there's some old songs, gospel songs that people would sing. Uh, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to walk the heavenly streets. Oh, them golden slippers, oh, them golden slippers, golden slippers, I'm dying to wear, to walk the golden streets, hallelujah. All right, some of them they got streets, I'm going to have golden slippers, I'm going to walk around, you know, but what, you know, God sitting up on a throne, somebody's up there, Jesus up there on his right hand side, that's about it. Oh, my Lord's house has many, my Lord's mansion has many rooms, all right? Not much to tell. You know? <laughs> or, unless you're a Muslim, in which case, if you've done right, you get all kinds of festival versions to serve you. And if you're a lady, I think you get young boys to serve you. Where they come from, I don't know. You know, but uh, that's what you're looking forward to. Kind of heavenly delights. That's about what the extent of it. But the spiritual realm, filled with selfless love and service, which is the real ecstasy, is missing. It's not really revealed. So, uh, the Bhagavad affirms that the Vaishnav soul, when freed from gross matter, will distinctly exist, not in time and space, but spiritually in the eternal kingdom of God, where love is life and hope and charity and continual ecstasy without change are its various manifestations. So he's opening the door a crack. There's love, there's hope and charity and continual ecstasy, consciousness, awareness, individuality. Uh, this is there. Now he's going to address two of the obstacles to coming into this personal conception of a spiritual realm with a personality of God. He says, in considering the nature of God, two great errors stare before us and frighten us back to ignorance and its satisfaction. One of them is the idea that God is above all attributes, both material and spiritual, and is consequently above all conception. This is a noble idea, but useless. If God is above conception and without any sympathy with the world, uh, how can it be explained this creation, the universe, composing properties, the distinctions, its phases of existence, the differences of value, etc. So what he's saying is that God is a person. This is the conception. That God has no attributes because God is spiritual. And attributes are a product of the material world. So attributes, qualities, conception, variety, personality, emotion, all these things are byproducts of the material world, so the spiritual world must be without all of these because it's opposite. The only way they can conceive through the mind and intelligence of spirit is that which is completely devoid of the qualities of matter. So they say God therefore must be free from all of these things, but that's a frightening concept for the soul. You have to be really practically suicidal to want that kind of spiritual union because in effect what you're doing is you're giving up your life, your individuality, your personality, your hopes, your aspirations, your dreams, your capacity to love, everything has to be sacrificed for that conception of God. And who wants that? You know, they say you have to surrender all ego. We don't say surrender ego, we say surrender false ego, the misidentification. So this is, he says, this mentality will frighten us 
back to ignorance and dissatisfaction because false ego and material individuality is at least better than no individuality and no existence. The only people reason that people take to the impersonal conception as conceived by the, the, the Maya boss is by just complete, total frustration. It's like people sometimes get the sense in this world, it's so bad, it's no longer worth living. So they jump off the bridge or, you know, drown themselves in the river or shoot themselves or whatever. So this kind of conception is like spiritual suicide. Uh, and then further he says, God is the creator of all things. That's the nature of God. You can't deny that this material world exists, so it has a source, which we call God. And if this material world is full of attributes, full of variety, properties, distinctions, phases of time and existence, then where does it come from? It must come from some source. That which is in the part must also exist in the whole. Something that exists in the part can't not exist in the whole. Uh, something's the source. This is also stated in Ishapanishad, right? Uh, you know that verse? Om Purnam. We should sing it on Sankirtan. Purnam. That verse, and Srila Prabhupada used to quote this a lot, uh, that it essentially means Om Purnam Adat Purnam Idam Purna Purnam that everything that exists as a, as a complete individual unit emanates from the grand complete original unit. And yet every part that exists is also complete in itself. So it acknowledges that yes, we exist we are complete individual units. Everything we see is complete and individual. But they come from an even greater complete part. But even though they come from that great complete source, that source, even though it emanates so many different things, it's not diminished in any way. It also remains complete and whole. This is the nature of the absolute. And then there's nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitanam eko bahonam yoga dadati kamam that all the eternal conscious living beings, the innumerable ones, emanate from a single original conscious eternal living being. Nityo and nityanam, singular and plural. So um, it doesn't make sense. And when you approach Mayavads or hardcore impersonalists who try to say that this is all illusion, well then where did the illusion come from? Oh, it's just illusion. But you're saying that the absolute is one and complete and perfect and beyond illusion. And so how did this illusion arise? There must be a distinction between that and this. Well, there's no distinction. But there is a distinction. You're making it. You're living it. They, they, they get caught up in this philosophical contradiction. But when you become entrapped by that kind of philosophy, you can't see the obvious self-contradiction. And you end up just saying something, well, that's part of the game. <laughs> that's all they say. You know, they, uh. So uh, the other error is that God is all attribute, intelligence, truth, goodness, and power. He said, but this is also ludicrous. He says that scattered or diverse properties can never constitute a being. Uh, uh, in other words, you don't define a personality by the properties. The properties are an aspect of that person, not that they compose a person. You know, these are, these are, 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 are symptoms or attributes. And also, if you just describe uh, a person based on properties, then how do you reconcile opposing properties like justice and mercy and fullness and creative power? These can actually be contradictory. Even though the Lord has these, justice means what? 
there's a law, and if you transgress it, this is what happens. Boom, boom. But mercy is that quality which overlooks, oh, you've done something bad, well, I'm not going to punish you as you get to be punished. Instead, I'm going to give you mercy and forgive you. Okay? Mercy is actually higher than justice, but the Lord has both qualities, and sometimes they're contradictory. Fullness and creative power. If the Lord is already full and complete, where is the scope for creative impetus and creative power? Because that means something new, something that's not there yet. So how can the Lord be complete and full, and yet at the same time have the need and desire to create? How do you reconcile and resolve these? Or, as one of the big problems in Christian theology, one of the great, you know, they used to argue how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Uh, and one of the philosophical questions say, oh, you know, there's God. We say God's all powerful, right? Omniscient. Well, then, can God make something so heavy that he can't lift it? <laughs> and they go, huh? And if you're a regular theologian, you're going to say, uh, uh, because if he is all-powerful, he can lift anything. But if he's all-powerful, he can create something that he can't lift. But if he can't lift it, he's not all-powerful. So, but if he can't create something that he can't lift, then he's not all-powerful. They get the logic. But if I ask you, can God create something he can't lift, what are you going to say? What? I was saying, yes, he can, and then he'll become more powerful so he can lift it. Give me an example of God creating something he can't lift. How about baby Krishna? Huh? Uh, he, he could hardly lift the shoes of his father. Is yeah, he, he could lift the shoes, but he couldn't lift the table very well. Well, why did Baba said, bring my table? But he's like, little baby, and he can't lift it. And he got tied up by his mother. He couldn't break that. But at the same time, he can do that. But by the influence of his own desire, he can sometimes do it and sometimes not. So he can create something that he can't lift. But later on, if he wants to lift it, he can. Yeah. Uh, this is the difference between, this is where the beauty of God and his Shakti come in, which we'll discuss later. That unless you understand the difference between Krishna and his Shakti, and the different transformations that the Shakti transforms, but God himself doesn't, then these apparent logical contradictions can't be reconciled. So God is all-knowing, but he can also be bewildered. Because if he weren't able to be bewildered, then how could he enjoy Ras? Because ultimately our description of God comes back to his very nature that he is the supreme enjoyer of Ras. So he has to be able to enjoy the position of strength, the position of weakness. So Bhagavad of course, introducing these concepts very subtly. Uh, so, uh, so, the truth as stated in the Bhagavad is that properties, though they may be uh, belligerent or contrary to one another, are united in a spiritual being where they have full sympathy and harmony. Certainly this is beyond our comprehension. It is so owing to our nature being finite and God being infinite. So he's not explaining it yet, how it can happen, but he's saying that these philosophical conundrums of contradiction that bewilder most philosophers and religionists are resolved and harmonized in the Bhagavatam and a conception of God who can harmonize and reconcile all of these things is described. Even though you're finite and won't be able to totally grasp them, the descriptions are there. That was getting more and more interesting. What kind of book is this? What kind of God are you talking about? This is a glimpse of truth. And we must regard it as truth itself. And then he quotes Emerson. He says, a glimpse of truth is better than a ranged system. And he is right. The arranged systems, in other words, law, philosophy, the boundaries and restrictions of logic and reason and grammar, these 
things bring us to a certain point, but truth exists beyond all of these things. These are sourced from truth, but they're not capable of limiting, they, they, they're not capable, they, they have their limits, and truth is not bound by them. So, uh, this is like one of the, the, the things that people get hung up with by a superficial reading of scripture, where they try to contain Krishna within the laws and the moral strictures of this world. The morality of this world, the laws of this world were created to contain, regulate, and guide us to our higher nature. But Krishna is beyond all of these, all beyond all of these, and his very desire is the absolute law. And therefore he can do anything, uh, which ordinary moralists would say, well, how can he enjoy with the wives or with the husbands or the wives of other men? How can he break his promise and, and, and ask Yudhishthira on the battlefield of Kurukshetra to lie and, and say something about Dronacharya, you know that story. Dronacharya, when he took over as the commander, he uh, was destroying the Pandava army. So powerful. And nobody could stop him. And so Krishna told Yudhishthira, unless we kill Drona, there's no way we're going to win this war. And the problem is Drona had a benediction that he would only die at, by his own desire. Just like Bhishma. And so Yudhishthira mentioned that and said, How will we kill him? Krishna said, He will only be killed if he thinks his son Ashwatthama is dead. So you have to tell that Ashwatthama is dead. And Yudhishthira, who was the pinnacle of righteousness and morality, said, But I can't say that because he's not dead. <laughs> but you must say it. I'm asking you to say it. <laughs> and Yudhishthira is hesitating. And he says, Hesitating. So Krishna says to Bhima, saying, you see that elephant over there? That mighty war elephant belonging to this king? That elephant's name is Ashvatthama. Kill that elephant. And so Bhima goes over with his club and he beats and kills the elephant. And then tells Yudhishthira, now you say Ashvatthama is dead. And so Yudhishthira says, all right, I will do. And then he yells out, a powerful voice that goes across the battlefield. Oh, but he's going to say the complete thing. Ashwatthama, the elephant, is dead. So just he says, Ashwatthama, the... Krishna tells Bhima, blow your conch! And Bhima goes, <laughs> And as he blows the conch, uh, Ashwatthama, the elephant. And he, nobody hears the elephant. And he stops, <laughs> and then Dronacharya hears this. He goes, oh, my son is dead. And he stops fighting, sits on his chariot, and goes into meditation. And then Krishna says to Tristaduna, who was born to kill him, to avenge and, and to fulfill the vow of the father of Tristaduna, Andropadi. What king, what name? Maharaj Drupad. Uh, Drupad, right. Maharaj Uh so Dhrushtadumna runs to the chariot and takes his sword and chops off his head. But he was already dead by his meditation. But then everybody says, Oh, Krishna has cheated! Ah, oh, he's lied! Ah, oh, and, and then Yudhishthira, whose chariot previously never touched the ground, then it descended to the earth, and from that point on it always touched the ground. And the mundane moralists, they say, That's because Yudhishthira told a lie. Therefore, he has lost his uh, position as heavenly, and now he has to touch the earth like all the rest. He was a god on earth, and now he's like the rest of us, he's committed a sin. But that's not the real explanation, is it? What's the real rest reason that his chariot touched the earth? Because he didn't follow the, the order of Krishna. Yeah, he lost, he didn't have faith in that order, and therefore, bold. Well, like that. So there's different ways to proceed, and there are many, many stories like that. Um, and then he addresses the fact that, oh, many people, they, they condemn the Bhagavatam and Veda Vyas because 
But he said he's glorifying an ordinary man, Krishna. Uh, and they scandalize Krishna's activities, and they say that this is a glorification of material love and material lust, and injurious to the principles of asceticism. Krishna's having relationships with all these uh, women married to other people. He's a debauchee. How can Veda Vyas glorify that? And, and this is one of the, they, they try to bring Krishna's activities down to the level of ordinary morality. And especially in the fact that 16,000 lives, he enjoyed with all these gopis, and this is your God, fighting, doing so many things on the battlefield, sometimes transgressing morality, cheating even Jarasandha, telling Bhima to fight with Duryodhana in an unfair way, breaking his legs below the belt, real Chatriyas don't fight like this. You know, so many things they accuse Krishna of. But, you know, especially regarding this, this lusty material thing, such shallow critics, uh, their mind will undoubtedly be changed if they reflect just upon one great point. But how is it possible that a spiritualist in the school of Vyas, teaching the best principles of theism throughout the Bhagwa, and making the four texts quoted in the beginning the foundation of his mighty work, could have forced upon the belief of men the notion that the sexual connection between a man and certain females is the highest object of worship. If you're saying that Vyas is you know, encouraging lusty relationships between uh, unmarried men and women, this does not, it's not consistent with the entire rest of the body of the Bhagavatam, nor is it consistent with his descriptions of the nature of Krishna. That, so, and, and, and Gurudev brings that same point up about Mahaprabhu. The Mahaprabhu is teaching that, uh, um, he says, Aradyo Bhagavan Vrajesha Kanayas Tadalma Vrindavanam. Our highest object of worship is Krishna in Vrindavan, and Ramya Kanchit Vrajavadu Vargena Jakalpita. That the highest form of worship is that performed you know, for the gopis for Krishna. Uh, but Srimad Bhagavatam Pramanam Amalam Prema Pumarta Mahan that this is the teaching of Mahaprabhu, that Srimad Bhagavatam is the highest evidence uh, for this, and, and this deep spiritual love is the highest objective. Um, and so when you analyze, though, would Mahaprabhu acknowledge or encourage something immoral like the relationship between men and the wives of other men? No, because the whole rest of his character is perfect sannyas, perfect control, perfect restraint. So, and, and, and even in his own lifetime, even his associate, Junior Haridas, who was a wonderful sannyasi, just because of a hint of an impropriety, he rejected it. And Mahaprabhu himself was just like the complete object of strictness. So why would Mahaprabhu follow or glorify something that was anyway material. So neither Vyas or any of the great personalities that acknowledge and put forth the Bhagavatam as the highest literature ever engage in anything immoral on the material plane. So how would he be teaching something about worshiping an ordinary man and glorifying lusty relations between material men and material women? This has all been kicked out way before in the earlier sections of the Bhagavatam from the very beginning. So, uh, so he says, yes, you critic, you nobly point to the immoral deeds of the common Vairagis who call themselves the followers of the Bhagavatam and the great Chaitanya. You nobly tell us that Vyas, unless purely explained, may lead thousands of men into great trouble in time to come. But dear critic, study the history of ages and countries. Where have you found the philosopher and the reformer fully understood by the people? So in other words, just because a lot of people misinterpret this and behave badly, 
doesn't mean that this is what Vyasa is teaching. It's not just in any religion. Look what they've done to the teachings of Jesus. Look what they've done to the teachings. I don't know. Some people say that Islam is the message of peace. So maybe it is. Look what they've done to it. <laughs> I mean, certainly you can't advocate what people are doing now. You know, strapping bombs onto the bodies of little children and telling them to go blow up women and other children. Uh, even Islam in its most severe couldn't have been advocating that. So in every case, the teachings of pure religious persons have always been uh, uh, mistaken and perverted by materialistic people for their own purposes. So never should you think that the teachings of the Bhagavad are advocating this. This is what he's saying. Uh, so whether you give the absolute religion in figures or simple expressions, or teach it by means of books or oral speeching, speeches, the ignorant and thoughtless must degrade it. And, and that's true. Actually, Gurudev, in his Sangha, Gurudev preached in such a spotless way these principles and advocated in so many ways the dangers of jumping ahead, misinterpreting, and yet there are people that call themselves followers of him and of our guru and of Sri Sri Raj that have advocated and are advocating even now that the path to understanding parakya ras between Krishna and the gopis is to experience it in this world. Yes. Yes. That they see ordinary people as their nagara and we're nagaris and if we experience this and the danger and the guilt you know, and the impropriety of it in a secret way, and don't tell anybody because it's a secret, then you'll get a glimpse, then you'll be able to enter into this. People are teaching that even now. There's a whole thing on the internet at the moment. Jack really? and Anders blog. Ever read like Jack and Anders blog, Calpug's Disciple? Mm -hmm. he, get, he, he gives a whole sadhana of how to achieve praying by finding a, by finding a sexual partner. Oh. And he's got whole pages on the internet how to do it. No, no, no. no, I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's because you've lived in Vrindavan for 30 years and chanting all the time, reabsorbing in books. You're not absorbed in the gossip of this mundane world, you know? You don't look and, at Facebook. No, but not, for, not even Facebook. I mean, I'm, I, I, people write to me and tell me things. What are you going to do about this? The sannyasi should get together and fix this. But this has been going on since time immemorial. Marat? This particular person, you know Mandela Publishing? Yeah. Mandela Publishing House? He, is one, he has been one of the main editors and translators for Mandela Publishing. Up until, I don't know, he may still be, but certainly up until very recently. He's a Sanskrit and Bengali scholar. I mean, you know, it's really scary stuff because he presents it in such a scholarly way. Right. That, you know, if someone hasn't got their guard up and they're new. Well, it's like this. Not only scholarly, but we all have these seeds of intense desire for these things still. And when somebody gives us some excuse to justify this kind of behavior on the basis of scripture, cheaters and the cheated. As long as we want to be cheated, there will be plenty of people to cheat us. Well, regarding this person that she's brought up, uh, I can tell the whole history. Uh, this person was a Prabhupada disciple. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, so we know his history of how he went to the brother of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, so uh, Lali Prashad. And then, for some time, he tried to become a Babaji in Navadvip, and right. he did extreme austerities, and Raganuga. It was the whole thing about Raganuga, right. you know. And not belittling or in any way criticizing, you know, this uh, personality, Dalip Prashad Thakur. But, you know, he went away from Prabhupada's line. And then, after some time, then basically he gave up that attempt, and then he became up to the from that time till the present time, just in the world, having relationships with women, this that. Even I met him in Canada a few years ago when I went to uh, Montreal, you know. And so he is—he's a scholarly person, 
he's a very intellectual person. And he's now got the, his website, his uh, Facebook uh, page, you know, and he's always talking about these topics and trying from a scholarly mm -hmm. point of view. Yeah. But in his personal life, this is the symptom, as Gurudev always told. But they, they can't follow the Upadesha Amrita. The first verse of Upadesha Amrita, Vacho Vegam, Manasakrota Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udara Upasta Vegam. Right. They can't follow it. It's like a thunderbolt for them. But he quotes that verse and says how he is following them. I won't get into the details now. He's so uh, tricky. We're in jugglery. Anyway, if you knew all the different people that have presented these kinds of things, you might faint. I mean, sometimes I've almost fainted when I've heard these stories, you know. I'm not going to repeat them. Yeah. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur is warning us and saying that this is not the Bhagavad, that religious teachings are always misrepresented by people with improper motives, mixed motives. And so the call is for us. That's why we are required in the stage of Saturn to regulate our activities um, because we don't, when you come into Rod Mark, then you're automatically regulated because you have so much attraction for the pure spiritual ideal that the material becomes completely unattractive or so diminished in its, its value that you don't care for it anymore. <laughs> kind of like if you were raised, then you grew up in a desert, right? And the only water you ever had to drink was from some little muddy hole with a palm tree next to it. And it's all muddy and it's salty, and, but that's all there was. And you bathe in it every day, and it took, but it quenched your thirst. In the heat of the sun, it quenched your thirst. Then one day, for some reason, a big old truck pulls up, and it, it, it's refrigerated, and they open the door, and they got this, what's this? This is crystal clear Himalayan water. What are you talking about? This is water, not an Ashtar water. It looks like water, but it's all mixed with all this other stuff. I'm like, what will this do? Oh, this will do more than quench your thirst. You know, and you take that and you drink that. And first you have this hot, salty, muddy stuff, and then you take this ice cold, crystal Himalayan water and go, oh my God! Oh, oh, oh. Now, a guy says, now, you know, if you want, I can leave you some here, or you can go with me. We can have this all the time. Now, what are you going to do? They're going to stay out in the desert and have that sun beat down, drink muddy water for the rest of your life. You're going to climb in that air-conditioned truck and drink that. Oh, and by the way, we also have mango juice, and we've got lychee, <laughs> and we've got all these different flavors, and you never have to drink muddy water again. Is a person going to be even inclined in any way to drink that muddy water? Not a bit. Not because it doesn't do something, but because it got a higher taste. Rasa Varjan Vasam Gyasya Param Vrishta Nivartate This is Bhakti. By experiencing a higher taste, you give up the lower. Um, so... But one point on that. You know, um, I'm just using the example of another person who deviated from Prabhupada and went in the direction of the Sahajis. Gauranga Nagari. In yeah. Navajri, yeah. Gadabar Pran. Gadabar Pran. So, you know, and years ago when I saw him in the early 90s, he was already on this trip, and uh, he told me, he said, he said, yeah, I feel that for my pathway of Raganuga Bhakti, Raganuga Bhajan, he wrote a whole little booklet about it. Mm -hmm. He said, it's better, better for me to have a house, to be a householder because then when my material desires arise, my lust comes, then I have an outlet for it. Yeah. And when he told me that, I said, okay, you're a Sahaja. <laughs> you, know, you don't have actual genuine greed, because what you're talking about, the taste of the pure water, that's only possible if somebody has genuine greed. And then, automatically, renunciation will take place. But this is artificial imposition of the mind, and that's what always happens. Just like the Siddha Pranali, where they're trying to, you know, get their knowledge of their spiritual form and meditate upon themselves and all that. They have no qualification for that. They haven't come out even of an art and vritti yet. Srila Gurudev said that if somebody is going to uh, enter into the path of Raghunuga Bhakti, then practically the minimum level is asakti. Well, he told asakti. Gurudev told Raghunuga, then the Raghunuga Pravriti starts. Yeah, but 
Gurudev, when I asked him this question specifically, I said, what is the minimum level of qualification for someone to actually practice Radha Muga Bhajan Bhakti? Right? Like Seva Sadaka Rupena, Siddha Rupena Chaturdhi. Because in the stage of Asakti, there are Spurtis. Advanced Asakti. Yes, advanced yeah. Asakti. There's different stages of Asakti also. But in that stage, finally, there's actual genuine perception of your own Siddha Swarup. But Spurtis are coming. Yes, and then in the stage of Bhav, then full realization. Then you're Siddha. You're no longer Sada. This is revealed in Jaiva Dharma. Yeah with Vajanath and Vijay Kumar, initially when they take Diksha, then they begin to have Spurtis. And they're getting very powerful attachment and taste in their Vajan, and it becomes transformed to taste for the object of Vajan, mm -hmm. and a small awakening of their own identity and their own mood of service begins to manifest. And then they approach Gopal Guru, and he gives them confidential instruction in internal bhaja. So it's not like it's like chop, you're first year in second grade, then you're in third grade, it's, it's blended. But actually, rod mark means not only to be experiencing symptoms, but to, to be awakened not only to your own identity, but to a relationship with particular eternal Vaishnavas and following them in service and, and having uh, uh, that relationship and that guidance on that higher platform. Right. As well. No longer guidance on external sada, but internal guidance on your internal sada. And you get it externally and internally. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and it grows and it grows and there's levels of love. But the Bhakti was trying to tell these people, intimate to them, that there is a difference. And first of all, you have to understand that this is not in any way material. And just because other people have said it is, it's not. Oh, it's not. So, now he's going to get into what we began yesterday, but I have to back up a little bit. The transcendental epistemology. So epistemology, remember the definition of that? It's the, what? It's uh, how we get knowledge. In it's the a, it's knowledge. A examining and understanding what is knowledge different aspects, phases, etc. of knowledge, and how we get it, like you say, exactly. So, any type of knowledge. Well, he, now he's saying he wants to talk about transcendental epistemology, and he'll make a distinction. Uh, he says that, now he begins, now for some of you, you may not have ever heard this, and some of you have heard it, but you've not thought about it so much. Uh, but this is key to being able to present our philosophy to others. So he talks about Lord Krishna and his three principal energies. He says, Sri Krishna, the ultimate reality, or Bhakti Rachat Sridhar Goswami was saying, reality, the beautiful, is one without a second. He is distinct from his energy. And this becomes very important later in understanding Mahaprabhu's conception. There's Shakti and Shakti Man. He is distinct from his energy. Sri Krishna is the predominating absolute. His energy is the predominating absolute in the three positions of Antaranga, Tatashta, and Bahiranga. Antaranga means internal, Tatashta means marginal, and Bahiranga means external, uh, respectively. If you ever read Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada, he uses the term the predominated moiety. Moya, moiety. He says both mo moiety and predominating moiety. You ever heard the word moiety before? No. You know what? I, I had to look it up. Sure. <laughs> But now I look it up, and whenever I tell people, they go, oh! <laughs> you know what a moiety is? I looked it up, but I can't, I can't remember the exact definition. Okay, imagine a P, right? It's got a shell. Take off the shell, the P has two halves. Mm -hmm. So a, mo a moiety is one of the halves. Each moiety is one half. So one half is the predominating moiety, one half is the predominated moiety. Unless you have both of them, you don't have a whole. 
So Krishna is the absolute, and there's no difference. He just manifests his nature in two aspects. But as it said, Radha and Krishna are one, but they have separated themselves eternally for the purpose of pastimes. So the Lord himself reveals himself in two phases. As Shakti Man, the predominating, he who receives and accepts service, that means Vishaya, and as the other half, the Ashraya, which we're talking about today, Srimati Radhika, she who is the abode of that love and that service. Um, that one is not superior to the other. The problem is when you talk to people, they say, oh, she's the predominated moiety. That's a you know, patriarchal religious conception where the man is superior and the woman's got to be the servant. You're a misogynist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typical religion, just like all the rest. But <laughs> it's not like that. And then the other side. Oh, the, 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 what is it called? The, the divine feminine. Oh, right. Some the, people, the reaction to that yeah. is that the goddess is supreme. The goddess, yeah. yeah. And that the male, they don't have a place for that. But actually, in Gaudiya Vaishnav conception, the conception of Mahaprabhu, we have the sublime harmonizing of those two conceptions. Because when you really go into the Bhagavatam and you understand it, and Later, actually, in Srila Prabhupada's purport to a verse that will come up later, he makes this beautiful statement about how Krishna is control. He cannot control praying. Praying controls him. Who is praying? What is praying? Mahaprabhu, or Ramananda Roy, explains that praying in its highest manifestation is Mahabhav, Srimati Radhika, is the personification of the highest praying, Mahabhav. She controls Krishna. And Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakura, when he explains the Ashraya and Vishaya Tattva in <coughs> his book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, he explains that uh, when you're trying to understand Bhakti, there are different features of it. And one feature is a lambana, or the foundation. The foundation consists of uh, the Ashraya and the Vishaya. That means one who is the object of love and one who is the container of love. And first he says how Krishna is the Vishaya Tattva and Radhika is the, and, and all the devotees are Ashraya Tattva. But then he says, but for Krishna, Radhika and the devotees are Vishaya and he is Ashraya because he has love for them. And when this is what Gurudev's speciality was because he could reveal in his stories how much great pleasure Krishna got in serving and pleasing Radhika, like this picture right here of Seva Kunj. Krishna is serving Radhika and Radhika is serving Krishna and they're competing. And it's a constant competition of service and this is described in Roy Ramananda Samvad in the most beautiful way. There's a constant competition between Krishna and the gopis to serve each other. And by that, both of their happiness expands, even though the gopis don't want anything out of that service other than to serve. When they serve Krishna, he becomes satisfied. When they see him become happy, they become filled with joy. And thus they become more and more beautiful. When Krishna sees their expanding beauty and their happiness in serving him, he becomes even more happy and he becomes more beautiful. And when the gopis see that, their love increases ever more, their impetus for seva increases, and they become more beautiful. And this is the never-ending, expanding cycle of love and competition to serve one another. And all the Braj pastimes that we're hearing from Maharaj and others, which I really appreciate, is this constant interaction where Krishna's devotees are serving him and he's serving them. Today, what did we hear? Krishna, oh, you sit and have your lunch, I'll go find the calves. You stay here and enjoy. He's serving his devotees. And that's so they're just taken very nicely. Anyway, so, Lakavinota uh, Kargosa. Can I sit and make one point? Yeah, make a point. Um, this, you know, this whole conception of Shakti Man. Yeah and Shakti, predominated, 
the dominator like this. And you so nicely expanded on this, as Chaitanya Charitamrita does, you know, to explain that it's all a matter of rasa. But in the material world, Srila Sridhar said power is the predominating or the most sought after thing. Mm -hmm. Power is. Like right. Aishwarya, right. the superior in the material world. Yeah. And that's why there's this conflict between the feminine and masculine natures because of power. Right. You know? But there, the superiority is actually by rasa, mm. by love. Right. You know, who can control each other by their love. And that's why Srimati Radhika always reigns supreme in the spiritual world. She, the feminine aspect is always supreme because she fully controls Krishna. Nobody else can fully control him except for her. And there was this one quote that I saw, somebody put it up on Facebook. It was a, some, I, I don't know exactly, it was some famous, uh, uh, well-known author. But he made a comment. He said, oh, nowadays we see that women are always campaigning and trying to become equal to men. You know, like women's liberation movement. But actually, this is very foolish of them. Because women have always been superior to men in almost every single way. And they always will be. That was the quote. And when I saw that, I thought, if he only knew the actual truth of that, the transcendental reality, that that nature is the superior controlling factor, even though Krishna is the supreme Ishwara and the supreme controller of all, but she controls him. So that superiority of the feminine nature, the predominated aspect, is more powerful than the predominator there. So it's just, it's actually quite amazing. Because all the material cosmic manifestations are controlled by him, but yet in the transcendental world, he's fully controlled by that feminine nature which personifies the highest love. And that reminded me of Srila Gurudev and his way of conveying and teaching us to practice bhakti, mm -hmm. he had this phrase, controlled by love. Yeah. And that's how Sri Guru wins the hearts and souls of all those who aspire to be his disciples. Not by demanding or taking or ordering, but by giving, 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 giving. Uh, if you just want to sit down in a room and remember stories about Srila Gurudev, you could remember, you couldn't remember them all. Maybe Brezhnev could sit and talk for a hundred days with a hundred mouths and he couldn't tell all the stories of Gurudev's selfless giving. You know? But it would certainly satisfy our hearts. And Srila Prabhupada, how he was able to start his movement in the Western world by giving, 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 serving, serving, serving. And what was the result? No loss. Because in this world, if you serve and serve, you're generally exploited. And people take, but they never reciprocate equally. But in real love, those in our, in our day, Sri Prabhupada's giving was so powerful. You know, I, I think about that now. We had a conversation the other day about that how the mood that we had and, and how this movement was spread so rapidly and, and how people were just giving everything to do this uh, is because he gave so much that we were never satisfied in our efforts to reciprocate. And Gurudev always taught that if you want to work together, don't try to control by force, by strength, by logic, by argument, by threat, by money, by administration, by administration controlled by love, mm -hmm. by affection. Mm -hmm. Just give, 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 and nothing for yourself. But in that mood, you have everything. Sure, Sri Ramesh, that is the mood of Sri Prabhupada, where you empty yourself of everything. Yeah. Of everything, but the order of your guru. And then you become filled in a completely different way. Yeah. So the Guru then said, and yesterday I read a quote from Sri Lagurgo Maharaj. He says, a real guru, he can control Krishna. Yes. 
if you cannot control Krishna, you are not a real guru. Mm. Right. But that what to speak, Srimati Radharani, she is, so they are so close and intimate with the that they actually Krishna is controlled by the guru. <sighs> Prabhupada often commented that when they had a big <coughs> challenge and he would say, do it like this, do it like that, like Bombay project for example. And then in the end he said, oh, now we are <laughs> victorious. Also good that we were going in Parikrama from one of the first years in 1994-1995. Perhaps we were there in the bus. We got stopped in... No, in the border, uh, the, border the border of Rajasthan. Kamyavan, coming from Kamyavan. Entering Varsana. We were all there. We were there and Gurudev jumped off the was. bus. Yeah. Well, you have to tell what happened before that so the others know. So usually when you cross a border in Braj, Rajasthan to... What is that other place? UP. UP. Yeah. Then you need to pay some tax. You can buy bus especially. A lot of so we pay all the tax in advance. We have right. all the papers. Yeah. But there's always some trick. Wherever you come, they try again to get tax from you. So yeah. they stopped us already one kilometer before the border. Right. In the busy street where the bus right. was stopped. And they wanted to see our papers. Tirtamaras had gone out. And Tirtamaras went out to show the papers. Show yeah. And then they didn't they didn't feel satisfied, they wanted more tax. And then right. Guru, Guru Dev jumped but, out. But they were surrounding him. Yeah. Guru Dev was watching from the no, bus. No, that is what Guru Dev was in the bus. bus. And, then, and they, they started to they push him. Push they they started to physically they push Tirtamaras. And Tirtamaras. So when they pushed the driver, yeah. that's when Guru Dev jumped out Guru Dev jumped out of the bus to get Tirtamaras and some other comics. They told us, you Westerners don't come out. You stay here. Guru Dev jumped and started to beat them with his danda. Yeah. Yeah. And then all came back at the bus very quickly. And we drove with the yeah. bus. Yeah. We arrived at the border. Yeah. And then at the border they tried to stop us again, which they did. And Guru Dev went inside with the Brahmacharis. They discussed. Nothing to pay. And Guru Dev came back in the bus and he said, Jai Jai Sri Rade. We have been victorious. And the person came in who had kind of committed this offense yes, he and touched Guru Dev's feet and asked for forgiveness. Yes. He drove behind us to the next. So Srila so. Prabhupada also, <coughs> you must remember the projects that he, the challenges that he faced in Bombay especially. Yeah. Mr. Nair. And in the end, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nair went down. He, his own balcony uh, broke down and he went down. And also with his recalcitrant disciples. The Guru has so much love like a parent, and we disciples can create so much trouble for our Guru. Even that, we're talking about Bombay, even after Sri Prabhupada had overcome all these obstacles and they had finally gotten it, he left, and then for some reason, the local devotee who was still there in charge had been strong-armed by that Mr. Nai and had given up and signed it back. Huh? Never heard of that one. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> that's covered. Whoa. That's covered over. But then Shula Prabhupada went, what? And wrote a letter and, and, and then went back to the shelf and somehow or other overcame that. Oh. And Vrindavan, they had so much trouble getting that land. We don't know what he actually went yeah. through uh, to, to acquire those. It's not easy in this world. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. You're speaking from experience. Yeah, I am. But even whatever struggles we have just pale in comparison yeah. to what they had. Uh, just pales. Well, I guess we should stop here. We can continue tomorrow from this point. Uh, he's going to expand on... This is where he gives a summary of Tattva Sundarma. He'll talk about, in a little more detail, about the three energies. Um, then this is really interesting, the methods of approaching the absolute, which in simple terms, ascending versus descending knowledge. You give Sanskrit terms and, and subtle distinctions. And then uh, the difference between you know, what, what is active and passive hostility, 
and active and passive devotion. It's very interesting terms, or, or active and passive subservience. Very nice, very nice. Um, and then the dawning of pure theism as opposed to hostility. Then he gives a breakdown of the mind, Paramatma and Bhagavan. And then again, detail on Samanda, Abhideya, and Prayojana, the principle of Radha and Krishna, and then the individual jiva soul, and then how monists misunderstand Krishna Leela, the transcendental purpose of Vardhashram, uh, more detail on Abhideya, and the nature of transcendental branch leela. All these ways are going to describe helpful for us because we try to describe this. See, so many times when devotees go out preaching, even experienced devotees, I know I've seen this, even sannyasis, they start preaching about you're not this body, and one minute later we're in Vrindavan with the gopis. Uh, <laughs> you can't talk to somebody like that and go from A to Z so quickly. It's a, it's a progression. And even when you are in Z, you have to be able to explain it in language that won't invoke the wrong ideas based on people's preconceptions. So Bhakti Kori is going to give this, and he's going to give a comparison and differentiation between transcendental and mundane sexuality, because this is a big hang-up that people have. And actually right now, all over the world, because people are so eager to take the bhakti, uh, this injection or intervention of the mundane conception of Krishna Leela is everywhere. In our movement, we see it in pockets here and there. But in the world, in the, in, in the world of you know, the general so-called yogis and spiritualists and, and transcendentalists, their conceptions are just infested with this, this mundane conception. Uh, and if you associate with people like that, then you can also get affected. So anyway, uh, then Prayojan described in a pure way the fruit and then the end. So, Along the way, we'll stop and, 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 and sidetrack into evidences and statements from Bhagavatam and other places uh, to give you, show you what he's actually talking about. Uh, but, so is this understandable? You get some of this? It's all new and kind of heavy. I, I wonder if it's like, remember the first time you ever read Brahma Samhita? Oh. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. I remember I was at New Bhakta and I opened that and the materialistic demeanor cannot possibly something about the transcendental autocrat and I go, oh. <laughs> I didn't understand any of the words. What? The what? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like when I was in seventh grade and, and someone said E equals MC squared. And we thought we understood it. Well, E equals energy times mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. Oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I understand it. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Okay. So uh, we'll continue tomorrow as sure. best we can. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare